So my name's Letizia Trevis, and I'm the James and Sarah Sassoon of later Italian and Spanish paintings here at the National Gallery. And I'm the curator of Bartolome Bermejo, um, Master of the Spanish Renaissance, which is in our room one. It's a free exhibition. It's on till the 29th of September. So if you haven't seen the show yet, please do go. And if you have, go back after this lecture. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Tobias Capwell. He is curator of arms and armor at the Wallace Collection here in London. And he is one of the world's leading experts on medieval and Renaissance weapons and armor. He's the author of many books and articles on the subject, uh, including uh, Masterpieces of European Arms and Armour at the Wallace Collection, which um, was awarded Apollo Magazine's Book of the Year in 2011. Toby may also be known to you through his radio and television appearances, most recently in BBC's Stitch in Time and Channel 4's Richard III, New Evidence. Um, and in fact, when Richard III's remains were exhumed and reburied in Leicester Cathedral in 2015, Toby was one of the two horsemen leading the burial procession dressed in full armor, uh, the full armor of a medieval knight. <laughs> and I think you can see that on YouTube. I think you can see that one online. Um, I first met Toby in early 2018 when our painting of the Archangel Michael um, was in conservation and undergoing treatment. And we'd asked uh, Toby to come in and talk us through the armor in our painting. Um, and because it's something that hadn't really been studied in any great detail. And what Toby had to say was so fascinating, we then asked him to contribute an essay to the book that accompanies the exhibition. So I would encourage you to buy that book because Toby tells me what he's gonna talk about today is not a repetition of what's in that essay. Um, but I want to thank Toby so much for um, really deepening our knowledge of such an important aspect of our picture here in the National Gallery and also for giving up his valuable time today to talk to us about Bermejo and also how Renaissance artists use the imagery of arms and armor um, to communicate messages of power and faith in their work. Tobias. Well, thank you so much, um, Letizia, for inviting me and the National Gallery for accepting my work on this. Um, it is enormously gratifying for me to work on this project. Um, I, I'm an arms and armor specialist, but I'm also a curator in an art museum. Uh, most great public collections of arms and armor are in art museums. But even so, uh, the idea that armor is art, as well as functional technology for fighting, is not necessarily obvious or, or self-evident. and. I, I seem to spend my life banging on about this aspect of armor, that it is not just a decorative art form, but also a deeply expressive art form of great power. And it's, even if you're not hugely interested in arms and armor itself, um, if you have any interest at all in historical art, in any art that was created when, when armor like this was in use, uh, essentially, from the 12th to the 17th century and even beyond since it continues to figure in 18th and 19th century portraiture, for example, you need some kind of working awareness of armor. Um, it's, it, it's the central feature of a painting like this. It's one of the key tools that the artist is using to communicate uh, with, his, with his audience. And these devices were the part of the living, breathing, everyday reality of people in the 15th century. But they aren't usually now. Uh, but however we're going to do it, we need to uh, cultivate uh, the ability to look more at these artworks from the point of view of the people that were there. And that requires literacy in this visual language, uh, because that's what iconography is. But if you don't fully understand the sentence structure and the grammar and vocabulary of this visual language, you aren't gonna get the message, or you're going to get it in a general way which is not as sharp and specific as the artist intended. So that's why you should care in a general way. Um, and we'll get into the specifics in a minute. Um, just briefly, I think it's important to uh, say a little bit of something about how I ended up doing what I'm doing. This does seem 
perhaps to be a rather specific area of medieval and Renaissance art history. Uh, and for me, it really started in an art museum. When I was four years old, I was taken to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which has one of the world's great collections of medieval and Renaissance arms and armor. And this is what I saw. Um, actually, not at, not at nighttime, obviously. That's the, the photographer's prerogative there. But, but I, think it, I think it communicates the impact of this, certainly if you imagine yourself as a small boy stood in front of that. <clears throat> and uh, this isn't, incidentally, what it looks like now. This central figure here uh, has been taken down since because he's mostly a 19th century reconstruction. But I didn't care about that when I was four. Uh, I was just, you know, you know, suitably impressed by aw the awesomeness of this in the true sense of the word. Um, and, you know, this is a, a profound expression of power. Um, it's worth reminding ourselves of who the medieval Renaissance aristocracy were. They were a class of people whose authority was based on physical force, uh, but it was also based on a premise, the idea that they had access to special power, uh, that they had been chosen by God to wield divine powers on behalf of the rest of us and those powers are not accessible to the rest of us. They are closer to God than us. They are part of this special class. They are superhuman entities. Um, and the equipment and the horse is a hugely important part of that because those essentially are physical proofs that what these people are saying to the world is true. It's demonstrably true in practical terms. Obviously, when you have a horse like that, who's you know, very well trained, uh, you have the speed and strength and height above other people. Uh, those are superhuman attributes that are now available to you in your left hand as you sit on this thing. And then, of course, knights uh, are trained from childhood to fight with advanced martial arts systems, fighting with both with a variety of weapons and with no weapons at all. Um, the training of a knight was very much like playing a musical instrument. In many ways, it's analogous in that um, it's an advanced, highly technical, physical skill. And if you want to be good at it, you have to start when you're a child. Not to say you can't start later in life. Of course, you can if you're dedicated. But you're never going to be as good as the people who started when they were five. Um, and there's a, there's, this is expensive, and this is time consuming. So the luxury of time and expense is again part of the aristocratic uh, identity as well. But that very advanced martial arts training is another superhuman attribute. These people um, have a power and the luxury to perfect it um, that most people don't have. Uh, and finally, there's the armor, this extraordinary anthropomorphic machine that imparts close to physical invulnerability. It's not totally invulnerable because you still have to move and run around, and as soon as you introduce the need for mobility, the protection comes down a bit. But still, it's remarkably effective. Armor allows you to survive terrible physical punishment that would kill an ordinary human being um, instantly. So the superhumanness of these people on Earth is real in all sorts of ways. So arms and armor and the courtly culture of the night is really underpinning everything that this society is about, that, that proving on Earth that the power of God flows through them. So I didn't, you know, I didn't get that when I was four. It's taken me a while to work that out. Um, and I'm still working on it, but the effect was still there. I may not know, I may not have known why it was having this effect, but it was. I felt it. And, you know, I think 
Images like this are ultimately about the empowerment of the individual and incredible physical or spiritual power vested in a human form is very appealing to everybody, but certainly to children because they're not empowered. Uh, you know, where they go, what they do, what they eat, what they wear, when they go to school, when they come home, it's all decided by someone else. So I think that's why uh, children are, are fascinated by knights often, and I think that's probably why they like pirates, dinosaurs, and superheroes as well. It's part of the same thing, really. Um, I should say that this experience didn't make me think, I want to be a curator in a museum. It, it made me think, I want to be a knight. So that's what I went off and did. Uh, I started, it took me until the age of 11 to wear my mother down to the point that she would let me start riding horses, because it's dangerous and bad things can happen. Uh, but I started riding horses when I was 11 and various martial arts trainings and things. And about 25 years ago, I helped found the modern historical jousting community, which is a uh, a historical sporting community, quite separate from reenactment, really, historical reenactment. Um, and it's real competition with the real gear as close as we can to the, phys the real physical experience. So the lances are 12 feet of solid pine, uh, steel spearheads. Everything is as real as we can make it. And I, I, I've always felt that dealing with a, 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 an inherently physical subject like this I am, I am morally obligated to explore it physically and hazard my body in the pursuit of the subject. So I, I try to always look at it physically, and when, you know, when I'm looking at a depiction in art, I try to uh, look at it that way as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Of course, I am also now a curator in an art museum at the Wallace Collection, uh, not far from here at Manchester Square. Um, the main collection of arms and armor um, in, in London. Uh, and so I, I keep one foot in each camp, one foot as a, you know academic specialist and then also as a practitioner, and those two approaches um, have a lot to offer each other. So armor as art. Um, I don't like to be too prescriptive about how you should go and look at things. Um, you should decide that for yourselves, but it's also my role as a specialist to offer cognitive tools, which you can consider to use if you don't have them already. How do we look at armor as art? How do we get past that, that immediate reaction to it as functional utilitarian equipment? Um, that's like a brick wall. You know, when most people hit that brick wall of functionality, it prevents them from then going on to think about it as art. It's because the modern mind usually wants expressive art and, and uh, utilitarian equipment to be two entirely separate things. Uh, but that's a relatively new development intellectually, and people in the Renaissance wouldn't have known what you were talking about or understood why you would want to think that. Um, first, armor is sculpture. It's, uh, it's a hollow sculpture. It's a sculpture designed to contain the body of the artist patron, um, but it's still sculpture with enormous expressive power, um, even before you've done anything with decoration. The wonderful thing about Italian armor in, in the 15th century is that even when it's worn by the richest and most powerful men of the time, in this case, Federico da Montefeltro, the patron of Piero della Francesca, um, he's as wealthy as they get, and yet he still wears a pure, undecorated, polished armor. He's got a very nice cloth of gold, jornea, and gilded sword, and you know, there's no mistaking uh, his status, but there's something about the purity of sculptural form that the Italians always uh, prized. And uh, you know, think, if you think about this, this is actually kind of profound in a way that, you know, as an art form, armor is a process through which the artist transforms the patron himself into a living artwork. Um, it's an incredibly personal and immediate and intimate art form, therefore, for the people who are using it. Um, you know, painted 
ceilings in certain chapels are wonderful and everything, and still very closely connected with the intentions uh, of the patron, but they are at a certain remove. Whereas this is on the body itself, it, it fuses with you physically, it becomes you. Uh, it's what the world sees. It, for the rest, once it's on, for the rest of the world, this, uh, this is the same as the person inside. So that's, um, uh, it's providing a lot of potential um, for different kinds of very specific expressive messages. Uh, notice also, although it's plain and undecorated, there is one key point that people often forget about, that the polish, the surface finish of the armor is an essential decorative technique as well. Piero, Piero della Francesca has had a good time showing us that he can paint reflections. If you look at that extraordinary mirror-polished helmet. Um, polishing was fantastically expensive, incidentally, and in far more expensive than the hammer work. So it, and it has nothing to do with functionality. You know, shiny doesn't make you any safer. It doesn't stop a sword or a, an ax any better, but it, it makes you look magnificent. That's a, that's a proof, my friends, that what you're dealing with here is an expressive art form beyond the, the functional. And the armorers themselves um, are often misunderstood as individuals. You know, these are not hairy blacksmiths living at the bottom of someone's garden working on their own in a slightly eccentric way. Um, these are highly paid, uh, highly organized artisan craftsmen, um, the greatest of which all self-identified as artists first and engineers second. Um, and you look at who they socialized with, who they collaborated with, who they intermarried with. The great armorers were often married, uh, uh, intermarried and related uh, uh, by marriage to artists and artist families. Um, Hans Birkmeier, for example, his sister was married to an armorer. Uh, the, once you start looking, there's a lot of connections like that. Uh, and incidentally here, this is interesting, He's, this, this is uh, part of the, um, the polishing process. This character here is using a, an abrasive impregnated scraper to hone the polish on a cuirass. You can see it's pinned down there on his workbench and he's scraping away. Uh, I've seen the same technique still practiced in India, and they can get an absolute mirror polish by finishing this way. It's laborious and very expensive, but it's, uh, they, can, they can do exactly what Piero was showing you a minute, uh, a, a little earlier. Um, the plates are also worked both hot and cold. They've got a forge for hot working, but you can see he's holding the plate here with his hand, so he's cold working it as well. Um, this is, a, this is an industry. This is a, a, a armorer's workshop is uh, organized with a master at the top, uh, various specialists, apprentices, journeymen, laborers, all organized around him. The great Italian workshops of the 15th century had hundreds of employees working under a single master. Now, moving on to iconography, uh, the representation of armor in art. Uh, this is important because if, if the real equipment had this expressive power, then any artist who can draw or sculpt decently can hijack that expressive power and, and use it in their work. Uh, the, you know, the, the, rep, the representation of the image still works in the same way. Um, but Bermejo is working at a time when the iconography of, of armor had developed hugely from what it had been. Just to give you an example, um, before the late 14th or early 15th centuries, historical subjects were all, almost always represented in terms of the absolute contemporary. So here, this is a representation of um, uh, a siege taking place during the Jewish War um, in the first century AD. Um, but if you don't know the source, uh, there's nothing in this at all that would tell you these people are Romans, uh, except, of course, the SPQR banner. Um, there's no iconography that's going to tell you who these people are, so they need a label, effectively. And if you see the SPQR banner, you know you're dealing with Romans, but there's nothing else that tells you that. Um, his historical or an ancient aesthetic was not part of the, of the culture yet. But of course, 
from the early, uh, the late 14th century, more artists are showing more interest in Roman art and cultivating an awareness of what real Romans looked like, and therefore intellectually cultivating a sense of chronological range and progression and distance. So history is not just about us anymore. It's about you know, our forebears and, and how in art do we give a sense of that temporal distance. Um, so they're looking at real art, and then of course there's a lot of wonderful stories about artists like Brunelleschi and Donatello going to Rome as young men, dig, physically digging up Roman sculpture themselves and studying it and arguing about it. And then Donatello goes home to Florence and immediately comes up with his remarkable, uh, very famous sculpture of St. George in not contemporary 15th century armor, but actually a hybrid of modern and Roman equipment. And the, the Roman was very rapidly um, incorporated into the, into the iconography of the whole uh, pan-European culture. So by the middle of the 15th century, there's a very advanced um, system for representing ancient people or um, people who are in one way or another other. And different artists, you know, the, the different great artists have their own distinct take on this. But you can see that it's, move, it's using the basis of the Roman model and then elaborating it in 15th century terms. So the way they, the Roman armor breaks up the body and the way it sits on the body is very different than, than a contemporary armor. They draw out the torso. The torso is very elongated and uh, incorporating the lower abdomen, which um, uh, you know, contemporary armor doesn't do. Uh, but this is now part of a, of a much more um, uh, diverse and elaborate visual language. By the 15th century, artists have a lot of different options for the way they, they portray certain um, historical uh, and supernatural characters. At the same time, there's still plenty of uh, contemporary uh, visualization going on. So take, for example, another famous picture from the National Gallery's collection, Perugino's St. Michael. Um, this, is, uh, this is very you know, elaborate, and he's, there's no mistaking him for any earthly warrior. Uh, but Perugino started with a very careful study of a real armor, a model wearing a real armor, before then going on to elaborate it into the, uh, you know, the iconography that he's after adding the wings and the jewels and so forth. But there's the original drawing, and that's what he was looking at. And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a technical, the, the technical accuracy is important, um, as, as we will see. Um, but it isn't as simple as saying this is accurate, this is not accurate. Um, artists will use technical accuracy and detail for all kinds of different reasons, and we have to, we have to become sensitive to it. So f by the time they have both of these uh, iconographic options, you start to see, there's, there's Piero again, you see them using it in different ways. One good way you can use it is if you want people to be able to tell who's who in the middle of a battle. Um, so here, um, the uh, uh, Heraclius versus Shows Ruiz, uh, um, the, uh, the Byzantine or East, Eastern Romans are all wearing the very latest up-to-date uh, Italian armor for Piero's own time, while the Persians are wearing that, what we can now call the heroic style. Um, you know, they're not intended to be Romans, but they're intended to be exotic and strange and alien, and it's all kind of the same thing um, after a certain point as, as far as they're concerned. Um, and of course, uh, that, that contrast can also be used to clarify the distinctions between individual characters. Um, saints and angels, it can be often confusing telling who is who. If there are a bunch of figures in robes, how do you know which saint or which angel they are? And that's, the whole, that's why we have the whole system of attributes for, for distinguishing uh, angels and saints. Um, and here is our, here is our, um, our starring role, St. Saint, uh, Saint Michael, on the one side here. Um, but now we see 
another warrior angel in the same uh, work of art who's shown in that other heroic style of armor. They exist side by side. They can, they can stand together, but it gives you that really sharp contrast, and there's no confusing who's who. And of course, you know, the, the, um, the, the devil and the spear and the scales all help to you know, reinforce the difference. But even so, it still can be uh, hard to tell them apart, and this is one good way that 15th century artists can do it. Um, and of course, Michael uh, is often armed in this heroic Alantica style, which depending on the treatment of the particular artist can really go pretty far out into the realm of fantasy. Uh, again, one of the National Gallery's paintings there, uh, Crivelli St. Michael. Um, uh, I, this is important to go through because we need to know more about the specific choices that Bermejo was making in his picture. Because you know, you only recognize them as incredibly firm, specific choices in that picture if you see what else was available, potentially. Um, this is one of my, this has got to be my absolute favorite warrior angel artwork. Um, this is the ceiling of the Ducal Chapel at the Castello Sforzesco in Milan, uh, painted in about 1470. So pretty much contemporary with, with the Bermejo painting. And here, this is very rare to see a rep, an attempted representation of the whole heavenly army together, not just this angel or that angel. Um, Michael is there, but he's there with all of his uh, soldiers. And some of them are depicted in that modern contemporary way, wearing contemporary full plate uh, armor of, of the middle of the uh, 15th century in Italy. And then others, again, to distinguish them as individuals, are wearing this outlandish uh, heroic style. Again, based on Roman equipment, but very heavily elaborated with the imagination. And in this case, Michael is wearing one of those elaborated armors, the, the, the finest of the group. Um, this isn't actually as fantastical as it looks. By the middle of the 15th century, it's clear that Italian armors were really making things that looked like this. And in this case, the artist has gone to some trouble to show you that parts of it are gilded, while others have this distinctly purple hue. Uh, and the way that's achieved on steel, it can be achieved on steel is through the process of heat tinting. You can get bright iridescent purple on polished steel, if you know what you're doing, and that, that, that's what rep is represented here. Um, so it's, it's quite a group, but each individual taking different aspects of those different styles, um, they, they all come out very clearly, they're all identifiable as, um, as individuals. Uh, then, of course, going even further into the realms of fantasy, from the 14th century, there is also um, a precedent for showing Michael in kind of much, much wilder, um, non-real terms, with an armor, an armor made out of feathers, and you know the coloring going really beyond what you you would ever expect to see on Earth, um, and you know having much more in common with artistic conventions for depicting seraphim and so forth when they're bright red or bright blue or, you know covered in gouts of flames or, or whatever. This is a very different approach again. Now in, uh, in Northern Europe, of course, they were, they, by the middle of the 15th century, they were aware of the heroic style, but they didn't have necessarily the immediate access to real Roman art. Um, and and they're, getting, they're getting their awareness of this, of this style um, through you know several other layers, but you can you can they and th therefore they develop it in their own way. So um, Van Eyck's uh, Last Judgment, for example, has a fairly typical by this point Netherlandish take on the heroic style, um, which is you know still very impressive and lots of gilding and gemstones and things, but it's less you know identifiably Roman. Uh, than, the, than most Italian treatments. Uh, but that's elaborating um, the uh, conventions of, of depiction still further. 
Um, the the uh, you know, Van Eyck really uh, has created a number of the um, most famous uh, instances of the, the kind of northern Renaissance heroic style. Uh, at the same time as, again, they are also often employing um, contemporary historical accuracy. It's really about the, the intentions and the tastes of, of individual artists. And these are applied to different characters. So, you know, who knows what Michael is? He can wear whatever he wants. Um, someone like St. George often wears contemporary equipment, but he is also identified in the Golden Legend as a Roman. Um, so the same style is applied to him. I mean, in, in, uh, in another of Van Eyck's works here, um, St. George and St. Michael, they almost seem to be wearing the same armor. Um, it's, it's not absolutely the same, but they, they, could, be, they could be twins. So again, it, it, it becomes difficult sometimes to tell them apart, especially in sculpture when the wings break off. I've seen a number of, of St. Michael's that seem to be misidentified historically because he's missing his wings. Uh, you have to look a bit closer to figure out what's happening. Uh, there's a nice example, incidentally, of the reason why it's easy to mistake St. Michael for St. George and, and why everything around it, all the other iconography, um, is important. You know, the, the monsters should look different, but sometimes they don't. I mean, sometimes the, 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 the satanic opponent of St. Michael looks like a garden variety dragon, so you can't count on him. Um, and they both often use spears, although he has the, uh, um, has the, the cross on his, so that's, and George doesn't, that's, that's one way of identifying them. And the cloak as well, or cope, that tends by the middle of the 15th century to be absolutely typical of, of, of St. Michael and not of St. George. Um, George often, not always, as you can see here, but often, usually, wears his gauntlets and his helmet because he's a real earthly soldier who fought on earth against a you know, purportedly real monster, whereas Michael usually doesn't. Um, I mean, there are exceptions, of course. There's one where St. Michael feels the need to wear his helmet and his bever, actually, as well, and gauntlets. This is very unusual, though. Um, but again, this is, this is later 15th century manuscript uh, treatment of those same styles, and you can see those, uh, the styles that, you know, spearheaded by Van Eyck in the middle of the 15th century, filter down and really become um, an everyday part of the culture in, in, in people's personal works of art, like Books of Hours, you have that fantastical treatment versus the typical uh, contemporary. Now, Bermejo was aware of all of this. Um, uh, and you can see it in his resurrection, in the present exhibition. Uh, he uses a, a, you know, a very impressive and you know, uh, individualized version of that um, Netherlandish fantasy heroic style for his, for his guards um, at the tomb. And uh, you know, there's, no, there's probably no real armor that ever looked like this, whether there's parts. There are, I mean, one of the, one of the real um, signifiers of this uh, distinctly Netherlandish heroic style uh, is that it has elements that are absolutely accurate, functional, and contemporary to the time of making. The leg armor here, the male defenses, the gauntlets, um, you know, parts, bits and pieces here and there are very good, but, you know, the ruby-eyed, monstrous shoulders and things probably never existed. But here you can see our, the artist who is our focus using that mad, fantastical style um, when he chooses to. But generally, in Iberia, this, this wasn't um, the prevailing fashion for depictions of the Archangel Michael. If you just take a quick inventory of, of, of his iconography in Spain, they invariably pick, go down the route of showing Michael as if he is a real knight of the time of the, of the artwork's creation. And that, um, that occurs over and over again, and it's very hard to find treatments uh, of anything else. They may just not have been, still, by the middle of the 15th century, not very aware of the heroic style, or, or it didn't suit their taste for, for whatever reason. 
So Bermejo is very much working in the tradition of, of, of Spanish art of the time. At the same time as his St. Michael really looks like no other Spanish painting up to this point. Um, and it, you know, it looks inherently, characteristically, distinctively Netherlandish uh, to me. And I'm only talking about the arms and armor. I'm not going any further. I'm aware that there's this big debate about whether Bermejo ever went to the Netherlands to study uh, with uh, here van der Weyden or whoever. Um, uh, and, and then other people said there's no reason he did. He could have done this entirely in Spain. Personally, and it's, it's my lecture, so I'll say what I want. Um, I, I can't imagine a world where he didn't go to the Netherlands. I mean, the, the, the iconography that he's employing here um, is just too Burgundian in too many visceral technical ways. Uh, let's just pause for a moment. How, how did he put this artwork together? Um, it's very clear, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. It's very clear that he started with a real armor that he had access to and that was set up for him on a model or some kind of stand. It might actually have been the very armor of his patron. That's, that's the, most, um, the most likely scenario, but of course he could have gotten armor from somewhere else. Who knows? But the armor that he started with would not have been fully gilded. It wouldn't have had any of the, de any of the decoration that you see on it here. It would have looked something like this. Uh, this is a, a, a reproduction Italian export armor made for a, a friend of mine, and it gives you a good idea of what most people were wearing. The, most of the armor that you would see in the real world that Bermejo undoubtedly had access to would look like that. That's where he's getting the basic form, the construction, the technical details. Um, but he then moves on from there and elaborates it. Um, there, is, there is an old tradition in Spain of uh, fabric-covered armor. It's not exclusively Spanish. Fabric-covered armor was uh, current throughout Europe, um, but it is more typical to see it in um, Spanish depictions of St. Michael than elsewhere. Uh, and there's a real one, um, just for reference, a very rare and important surviving uh, silk-covered uh, breastplate, now in Munich. It's an Italian one. Um, very similar in, in some respects to the one you see here, although his is front opening, so it's got, a, it's got a join down the middle, which this one doesn't have, but you get the idea. Uh, and it's st solid steel laminated skirt on the inside. That's what all these rivets are doing. Those are all attaching the individual plates and so forth. Um, so Bermejo has that fabric covered upper breastplate. Uh, that's, uh, a, in this case, a very nice silk velvet, green silk velvet. Um, Bermejo paints velvet and different textiles beautifully. They all behave differently under the light, and he shows you velvet when he means velvet. Uh, have another look at that specifically uh, upstairs. Uh, and then, of course, the next obvious thing perhaps is the, fully, the full gilding. Uh, it's not you know, silvery steel, it's yellow gold colored. Um, it's still made out of steel, uh, but it's been fire gilded. So you make, or mercury gilded. You, make, you mix gold with mercury, they dissolve together, forming an amalgam. You apply the amalgam to the steel surface that has been plated with copper to begin with, uh, and then you apply heat, burn off the mercury, it fumes off into the air. Don't breathe that in if you can avoid it. Open a window, um, and, uh, and the, the, the gold is left chemically bonded to the steel. And it's a very thick, very durable coating so uh, it's still perfectly good for fighting in, uh, just very, very expensive. I mean, it, you know, it, it, takes a, it takes an armor that would have cost uh, 25 or 40,000 pounds in modern terms and knocks it up into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Um, so, you know, there's not those, many of those around. They did exist on Earth. The Dukes of Burgundy were famous for wearing fully gilded armors, and here we have Philip the Good wearing one. Uh, forming a nice color contrast with his soldiers, who are all very impressed with his, with his appearance, no doubt. Um, so that's a real thing. You know, we start to see Bermejo taking that armor and then ramping it up as far as it can go, um, or perhaps even further that can actually go. We'll see. 
Um, just for reference, here's an example of a fully gilded helmet in the Wallace collection. Uh, this one's slightly later. This dates from 1555. It was made as part of a complete fully etched and gilt armor for the Emperor Ferdinand, uh, specifically to wear uh, at a tournament in Vienna in 1555. Um, it's covered in damage from swords and spears uh, in tournament combat rather than, than, than war, but still. Um, don't ever let your modern mind convince you that if it looks precious, it must be non-functional. Must just be for parade. They wouldn't fight in that, would they? Don't, that's your modern mind wanting to make a split between the functional and the expressive again. Don't let it do it. They ha it's not good enough to have this stuff. You need to fight in it. You need to destroy it in an afternoon of fun with your nightly friends. You need to throw it away. Conspicuous consumption, right? That's where the statement comes from. Um, and uh, uh, so, Toby, you might be thinking at this point, uh, that's all very well, but this is kind of a, a brushed matte finish. That doesn't look shiny like that's shiny. Um, what about that? Well, um, I have a natural inclination to take things apart. And um, that can get you into a lot of trouble when you're a child. It can get you into a lot more trouble when you're a curator in a museum. <laughs> and before you take something apart, you must first be sure, A, that you're not going to do any damage, and B, that you can put it back together again. So having um, satisfied myself that all of that was true and in place, um, I took these two bolts off uh, a few years ago. And these two bolts are securing the reinforcing plate for the left side of the skull. It's an area you get hit, at, hit in a lot um, by right-handed people. And everybody's right-handed in the 15th century. Um, so I took those two bolts off. And the first thing I noticed is the reinforcing plate is covered on the interior with a, an original 16th century coating of beeswax. So much so you can see the armorer's thumbprints in it as he's working it into the methyl. And this you know, hadn't been taken apart in quite a while. Um, and actually, uh, jousting treatises of the 16th century often say, coat the inside of your helmet with beeswax so that when someone hits you, you don't ring like a bell. Um, it can be very discomforting if you know, it's loud in there. Um, but that beeswax coating also preserved the original gilded surface as new. What you see here is something that's been you know, banged around for 500 years on the commercial market and then in the Wallace collection. It's, you know, it's lucky that it survives at all. Um, and it's very heavily abraded um, and, and at times in the 19th century over cleaned with abrasives. Uh, but that one protected area that I uncovered is like the day it was made. Um, and it's a, you can see the line. That's uncovered. That's protected. Um, and it's like a gold mirror. And it, it sets up this amazing visual thing where the, the arabesques are burnished bright like a mirror. And then that, scatter, that reflects light back into your eye while all these little twisting scrolls and things are, are, um, uh, are scattering the light. And you get this extraordinary visual effect when you see it as new. It's like the arabesques are forming like this glowing net all around the, the body. But the, my, I, I'm going a little bit off the subject, but the point is that fire gilding can be just as uh, a mirror finished as, as the steel underneath. Um, but it goes further, of course. We're not just dealing with a garden variety fully gilded armor, impressive though that would be. Uh, and that is indeed where many Netherlandish artists stopped. If you look at um, uh, Me Hans Memling's Last Judgment, there's a St. Michael, comparable in lots of ways. Beautiful, fully gilded, shiny armor, but it's just shiny and it's just gilded. There's nothing else there. Uh, and it's kind of hard to avoid the big, giant, precious stones uh, that have been, and, and pearls, that have been laid all over this armor, Bermejo's armor. And this is the point where most people just will not allow themselves to stay in the realm of reality. The gemstones and the pearls are where most people just say, look, this can't exist. 
This is the realm of pure fantasy. But we've, we've seen Bermejo work in pure fantasy. And it doesn't look like this. It's different. It's a distinct style, as we've seen. And everywhere else, the embroidery, the, po the point work, pointier decoration, all the hinges and straps and fitting is all perfect. So why would that be all perfect and absolutely literal and well studied and the gemstones aren't? It's, it's a big leap to believe that such an armor could exist, though. And some of you are thinking that. I don't blame you. Um, actually, there is a connection. Uh, in, the, in the resurrection, the back plate of this figure could very well be St. Michael's back plate. I mean, if I was going to rebuild this armor, and Bermejo hasn't shown us what the back looks like, and the St. Michael, of course, that's the next best reference to go with. You know, you've got the same decoration, those, those Gothic sprigs coming down and in, budding into trios of pearls, and then the alternating um, rubies. Those are actually what the Burgundians would call a ballet. Uh, it's a, um, it's a, like a, a, a light red or pink ruby rather than the darker red one. And sapphires and the, the ballet are in oval settings and the, and the uh, sapphires are in square settings, uh, alternating. I mean, it's the same system of decoration. So that bit's quite good. The thing that's different is that above and below, he goes off into the realm of pure fantasy while on the... Um, on the, the, the Michael, uh, everything else is rooted in, in the real equipment of, of this world and moment. Um, and there's lots more comparisons that you can find. This is, this is absolutely typical um, Burgundian uh, goldsmithing work uh, with gemstones. There's a typical uh, Burgundian goldsmith, uh, famously, with some clients. And what is he showing us in the background? He's showing us some nice set jewels and, uh, and things, and they've all got, and there's some ballet or rubies with the cabochon cut. The, the, the Burgundians love that cabochon setting where it's not cut into facets, it's just the natural polished stone. Um, not so fashionable now, I don't know why. It looks amazing. Um, and then you've got piles of pearls there and the amethysts as well, of course. Um, there's another close detail there. So you see, that's, that's it's not so far-fetched after all, although very expensive. Uh, and there's a, here's another example, the Burgundian crown of, uh, of Margaret of York, the bride of the um, Duke Charles the Bold. And again, same thing, a ballet. See that pale sort of pinky color? Uh, oval cabochon setting, alternating with uh, amethysts in, in cut setting, uh, cut amethysts in square settings. This is, this is the standard vocabulary of, of richness of, at the Burgundian court of this time. Um, and you see it even on the feet. There they are again, amethyst, uh, uh, sorry, sapphire, sapphire, ruby, sapphire. That's, that's the system. Uh, and then the, the, the pearls as well, each with its own little pin. You can see the pins retaining it all the way on. It's pretty believable. Uh, also, this is, uh, this, is in the art, this is in my chapter in the book, but I'll mention it anyway. I'm trying not to overlap, because you should go and read the book. It's a good book beyond my chapter. Um, but uh, this, is, this is worth mentioning, just to hammer home, in case you haven't read it yet, the reality of this. Is Bermejo, whoever set this armor up for Bermejo to study made a mistake. You know, it doesn't matter how good the armor is if the person getting it out of the box doesn't quite know what they're doing. Uh, and this is a real problem on Game of Thrones, actually. Uh, there's some, some basically good design in that show, however fantastical, but the dressers have no idea how to put it on the actors, and it's led to a lot of terribleness. Anyway, um, so here, you see this? His, his foot plates go up uh, and interact with the greave. That's the lower, the lower leg plate. And there's this spit sticking out there. Do you notice that? And there it is sticking out over there. And here on the side, he's given us a side view. You can see there's a little rivet. And then there's like this tongue plate coming out of the top of the sabaton. And it's sticking up at a weird angle. And it, and it, it looks odd. And it's not meant to be like that. Um, and if he'd had the armor set it up for him correctly, he wouldn't have done that. This is a remarkable uh, instance that shows us he's, cop he's looking at something real and copying it just as it is, even in the inaccuracies. Um, oh, just by the way, here's one of the only surviving examples of that same kind of foot defense of the same period uh, at the Wallace Collection. 
Uh, there are very, very few foot plates from the 15th century surviving sabatons. I don't know why that is, but there's, you can count them all on your fingers and still have plenty of fingers left. Um, so here you see the sabaton, and it's got that the rivet and the little articulated tongue plate. Um, but that's not supposed to be outside of the leg plate. When you put it together properly, it looks like this. That tongue plate is meant to go up inside the greave, and the idea is that it ensures a good interaction between the leg plate and the, and the foot plate, because you're moving your foot around, and it's rotating, and it's, it's moving up and down, and you, you don't want that overlap to get messed up. And if, you're, if you are so unfortunate as to have your tongue plates pop out, you can't walk very well. You, you, you can't do your job, because suddenly, imagine your ankle is basically locked, and it can't move, because those plates are stuck on each other. Um, so the, if this was on a model in Bermejo's studio, the model could have stood there and not been in you know, too much discomfort, but he wouldn't have been able to walk very well or, or do anything else a warrior needs to do. So I, I, that's, a, again, a, a side note, but I think it reinforces the, the reliability of, of what we're looking at. But even, but even the jewels and the gemstones and the pearls, the, the rows of pearls fretting the, the limb defenses are one of the real keys to understanding this. That's one of the, the most important parts. Um, because if you look at Burgundian art more generally of this precise period, for, late 1460s, early 1470s, before the death of Charles the Bold, that's important. Charles the Bold carried on the richness of the court of his father, Philip the Good. He wore those fully gilded armors, but he had even more extravagant tastes than his father. And the, the most extravagant age of the Burgundian ducal court was under Charles the Bold. Um, and that's when you start again and again seeing depictions of war leaders in tapestries and painting and manuscript illustration wearing fully gilded armors, uh, decorated with gemstones, and uh, there's some gemstones there, there's some more up there, uh, and lines of pearls. That whole combination, that combined, um, uh, those combined materials are absolutely definitive of this particular moment uh, when Bermejo is also working. Um, and if you don't believe all of that, and you still think this is all just in the realm of the imagination of artists, um, I will direct your attention first to my chapter where I give documentary evidence for Charles the Bold paying his goldsmith to decorate his armors with gilding, pearls, ballet, and sapphires. It's all there. He paid huge amounts of money for it, but he did it. And some of it even survives, or it survived up until the 16th or 17th centuries. This is Charles the Bold's war hat uh, that was captured by the Swiss at the Battle of Grinson, one of his famous um, defeats. Uh, one of several, uh, killed in the last one at Nancy, famously. Um, and this is, this is a German 16th century inventory illustration um, that shows the hat that actually existed. And, you know, that St. Michael would be proud to wear that hat, I think. Uh, you also have here a depiction of the famous Three Brothers gem of Charles the Bold, again with large rubies, pearls, and a sapphire. Um, so, finally, just in conclusion, um, what is all this about? Why is he doing this uh, versus choosing any of the, the fantastic other options that are available at, in this period? Uh, I think ultimately this is about realizing in physical terms something that most people will never see. Sorry about the slightly dodgy image there. I never expected I'd have a projector that good. Uh, the National Gallery is a better projector than I've ever seen in my life, so it shows up my, my uh, images that would look fine in any other circumstance. Anyway, um, this is about realizing, you know, materializing the non-real, taking something celestial, godlike, something from the heavenly realm, something from the other world, and making it seem as real and tangible as anything you will see in your everyday life. It's a collision of, of, of the earthly and the divine. Um, 
and and that's where its impact comes from. You know, it's not you know those 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 heroic armors are wonderful and everything, but they're pretty abstract and pretty pretty divorced from anything any real person could be expected to see. Whereas this is is still within the realm of what really existed, although the the rock crystal shield just won't work. But let's leave that alone. Um, and I was when I you know I, I've 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 studied and worked on this uh, for the project in isolation. But when I saw the exhibition for the first time recently and had my first look at the at the Last Judgment and Resurrection panels, uh, I was really struck by how Bermejo does this elsewhere in his art. It's not just on the Michael, you know, taking you know giving something so supernatural and beyond everyday experience, giving it this kind of visceral, tangible reality by taking things that really exist and incorporating them. He's doing this exact same thing with Lucifer. I mean, this is a tiny part of one of those panels, but if you take a close look at it and do go up and see the show again, um, you know, there, the, the way he's painted the skin, um, you know, it looks like it's taken straight off some Iberian adder or you know or, or lizard or something and he's he's taking something that's so real or the foot of a swan or a chicken or who knows what I mean they don't have that doesn't look quite like that but you know what I mean you know and giving it that, that this this could never this is this couldn't exist in our realm and yet all of the vocabulary belongs to us and it has a, it has this this power and, and, and this immediacy because of that uh, and that, sh that, that shows that, that Berme again, I think that Bermejo is working um, you know, above and beyond technically, but also conceptually, um, um, where art of his, of his time and region was um, otherwise at that, at that time. Thank you. <laughs>